Hi everyone, I'm Manuel Bio, part of the Developer Relations team, and today we are going to go through the different types of stakeholders we can find in the UI layer, when to use which, and how to produce green UI state. This talk assumes some basic familiarity with the architecture and the UI layer, so if you need to get up to speed, check out our architecture pathway that contains a ton of information about this. But as a quick recap, here's our recommended app architecture. Arrows mean dependencies in this context. At the bottom of the hierarchy, we can find the data layer, which is going to expose application state to the rest of the hierarchy and contain the vast majority of business logic. Then we have the domain layer, which as main mission is going to be simplify the potential business logic that could be present in the UI layer. And lastly, we have the UI layer, which is going to display the user information on the screen. Whenever the user information changes due to the user interacting with the device or external input, the UI layer should update to reflect these changes. And the UI layer is made up of two entities. We have the UI elements, or UI, that actually render the information on the screen, and we have stakeholders. Stakeholders are going to hold an exposed state to the UI and going to handle its potential logic. Depending on the types of state and logic, the implementation detail of these stakeholders might be different, and that's what we are going to cover today. The UI layer, you can find uh, different types of state in the UI layer. First one is the screen UI state that contain, contains the information we need to present to the user, mostly application data. And then we have the UI element state, or the internal state of UI elements. To see some examples of this, we are going to look at the Now in Android app, which is open source. You can check out the source code over there. Here we are looking at the interest screen for both mobile and tablet devices. As part of the screen UI state, we can find the list of interest under details and whether or not an interest is followed. As part of the UI element state, we can see the selected tab, selected tab in the bottom bar navigation and the scroll position of the list. When it comes to logic, we can differentiate by what the logic does. We have the business logic, which is the implementation of product requirements that define how data should be created, stored, and managed. As I said earlier, the, most of the business logic is going to be present in the data layer. And then we're going to have the UI logic that defines how to display state changes on the screen. And the UI logic depends on the UI configuration, such as screen size, language, or orientation. Depending on the UI configuration, the UI logic might be different. Here, looking at the interest screen again, we can see that loading uh, topics or following a particular one could be considered business logic. And then showing topic details or highlighting a selected item could be considered UI logic. You can see how showing topic details might involve navigation in a mobile device or could mean showing an element next to another in a tablet. It depends on the UI configuration. But we're in Android, right? And we know that configuration changes can happen. For example, if we run the app in, the, in a tablet, uh, in a foldable device, sorry, um, screen sizes are going to change uh, whenever the user unfolds or folds the device. And this affects how the different types of logic should be executed. The UI logic should be re-executed after a configuration change if it is affected. So for example, in a foldy state, we might want to show the bottom bar navigation. And then in the unfoldy state, we might want to show the nap rail. The logic to decide whether to show the bottom bar or nap rail should be re-evaluated or re-executed after a screen size configuration change. On the other hand, business logic should likely continue after a configuration change. You might not want to cancel an ongoing request to follow in, for example, an author just because the user rotated the device or unfolded it. That wouldn't be a great user experience. So given the different types of state and logic that we can find in our application, let's see how they relate to each other. We have the data layer, which is going to expose application state to the rest of the app. And we are going to observe it in the UI layer, and we are going to apply business logic to produce our screen UI state. This screen UI state is also going to be observed, and we are going to apply UI logic to modify our UI under element state. So given the differences between this type of logic, where should we handle them? The business logic complexity should be handled 
in a screen level state holder. And the UI logic should be handled in the UI itself or in another state holder. Both types of state holders can be implemented with plain classes. However, in Android, we recommend using architecture components view models as the implementation detail of this screen level state holder. We'll see in a second that view models are going to be in charge, of, in charge of exposing state, the screen UI state, and handling the business logic of the UI. We're going to take a look at some code now, some code now and we'll explain why this is the case in a second. We're looking here at the interest view model uh, which is going to manage the business logic complexity of the interest screen. You can see how it takes some dependencies from the data layer as part of the constructor. It is going to expose the screen UI state of type interest UI state here. And as you can see, like we will see later in a second, that the, the, how to create this screen UI state is going to be applying business logic by combining data from multiple repositories. And this also contains some business logic that is going to take care of user events, for example, following, following a particular topic. This event is delegated to the data layer, which is the single source of truth for this type of data. This request is triggered using the view model scope so that the request can continue after a configuration change. But why are we view models the recommended implementation details for screen level state holders? Because of their benefits. View models survive configuration changes. This can be scoped to an activity, fragment, navigation graph, or a destination of a navigation graph. And they live longer than the screen itself. That's why it's a great place to hold our screen UI state so that it's instantly available after a configuration change. And also, it's great to trigger our business logic request so that those requests can survive a configuration change. But not only that, it also integrates perfectly with other Jetpack libraries, for example, navigation. View models are going to be cached in memory or kept in memory whenever that destination is in part of the current back stack. That makes it ideal to, for example, to go back and forth between different destinations here in our bottom bar without loading the user data again. The data is instantly available. Also, view model instances are going to be completely destroyed whenever the destination is removed from the back stack. That's going to make it safe to go back to a previous destination without seeing previous user data cached in memory. View models also integrate, with, integrate well with other libraries, such as HILD, where you can easily inject your dependencies from the domain or data layers. But view models are really powerful. We shouldn't overuse them. So here's a list of best practices. Use them at screen level. Do not use them to manage the complexity of reusable UI elements like chip groups or forms, because we're going to get the same view model instance across different UI elements used under the same scope. Also, they shouldn't know about the UI implementation details. They should be generic enough to accommodate any type of UI. It could be a wearable, a tablet, or even a Chromebook. So keep the API surface, a screen UI state, as a uh, as generic as possible. Do not hold references of lifecycle related APIs, such as context or resources, because that could cause memory leaks. Again, remember, they live longer than the screen itself, so that could be dangerous. And lastly, don't pass them around. They are managed by the framework, and so keep them as close to it as possible, close to an activity, fragment, or a screen level composable function. If you pass them around, you are giving them more access and state, access to state and logic that they actually need. And that also could be dangerous. So if the business logic complexity is going to be handled in a screen level state holder implemented with a view model, the UI logic should be handled in the UI itself or in a plain state holder class. What to use here depends on the complexity of the screen. So let's start simple with having just some UI logic in the UI. Here, we are looking at a custom UI component that keeps track of whether or not it is expanded. The expanded, expanded variable is held and managed in the UI itself. But things can get more complicated, right? We can start adding more state and more logic to this composable function, and the UI is going to be complicated. So what we can do is delegate that complexity to a plain class. And Compose have a lot of this in their code base, in the library. That's what we call state holders. And here we can see the state holder of the draw, uh, the draw composable functions. It's called draw state. 
I'm just going to see how stakeholders are going to can expose state, like for example, whether or not the draw is open. And a nice property of stakeholders is that they are compoundable. For example, here, current state, uh, current value is going to get its value from another stakeholder defined internally from swipeable state. And they're also going to handle the UI logic, like opening the draw or animating to a particular value. The same way Compose offers this, you can do the same in your application. You can create your own stakeholders. So here we are looking at the now in Android app state, which is the uh, stakeholder for the now in Android app composable function. It exposes some state to the UI that is relevant for it, like the current destination, whether or not to show the bottom bar, and it handles UI logic like navigating or handling back click events. And what are those plain classes best practices in this case? Well, we say that we can use plain classes to simplify our UI, but actually they are recommended in reusable UI components so that you can hoist out the internal state if needed. Another best practice is that they actually can hold references of lifecycle related APIs. They are scoped to the UI. They are going to follow its lifecycle. So that, for example, if an activity gets recreated due to a configuration change, you are going to get a new instance of this class, of this type. So it is safe to do that. OK, so back to our diagram, we could say that the business logic and the screen UI state should be managed by a screen level stakeholder, view model in this case. And then the UI logic and the UI element state is going to be handled in the UI itself or in a plain class. Sometimes you might be, you might see that, for example, UI element state needs to be hoisted out into the view model because they are needed for business logic, and that's fine. That's totally okay. I think it's time now to play a little bit game, right? Uh, here we are looking at the screenshot of the now in Android app for view screen in this case, and as part of the onboarding process, you can select some interests and read some news. So let's identify all the different stakeholders that we can find here. We're going to have the now in Android app stakeholder, which is going to manage the UI logic complexity of the now in Android app composable function, mostly top level uh, navigation. Then we're going to have the for UV model handling the business logic complexity of the for you screen and also exposing screen UI state. And also we're going to find some other stakeholders in the UI itself managed in the composable functions like lazy list and lazy grid stakeholders. But you might have been wondering, OK, if we have a really complicated screen and all that logic goes to the view model, that's going to grow insane. It's going to be huge, right? And that's true. But there are different ways you can mitigate this. First, first way is introducing the domain layer. The purpose here, you can find more information in, in the documentation, is that some complexity, business logic complexity that is in the UI layer, it can be delegated to a use case. And even that use case could be shared across multiple view models as well. Another way to mitigate this is that you can create different stakeholders to manage the complexity of individual portions of your UI. So here, the view model would simply become a storing mechanism that survives configuration changes, and then the more targeted functionality is going to be delegated to the stakeholder. Earlier, I said that both types of stakeholders can be implemented with plain classes, and that's still true. The idea is that you should use view models in your application if the benefits apply to your use case, if the benefits apply to your app. So let's imagine that, for example, you don't need to use view models because, well, for example, when you don't need to survive configuration changes, maybe you are in a pure Compose app and you are handling them all. Caveat here, you cannot handle them all. For example, the wallpaper change in Android 12 and above devices cannot be handled. And let's say that you, know, you don't need to use navigation or heels because you have your own solutions. In that case, there is no need to use view models. But we actually recommend introducing this screen level stakeholder in your UI layer to simplify the UI so that it becomes more scalable and testable. So if even if you use view models, it could be a different implementation detail. It doesn't matter, but it's a good practice to, to have this screen level stakeholder. I talked a lot about logic in this presentation. If you are more interested in, about, uh, in state, check out the Word to Hoist That State talk by Andres Tamato coming up later today. So we've seen the UI layer pipeline, right? The different types of state and logic that we can find in, in our UI layer, and also how to manage the complexity of, the, uh, complexity of it. And now we are going to look at a particular part of it, how to produce screen UI state. The UI state is the output of a stakeholder processing some inputs. And those inputs could be events or local or external sources of state change. 
When it comes to the APIs involved, we can say that the UI state should be exposed as an observable data holder. And this guarantees that the UI always has a UI state to render on the screen. And the inputs can come in different forms. It could be one-shot APIs or streams of data. We're going to see some examples of this. For example, we are going to start with just a local source of state change that is going to create our screen UI state. We're going to see how to model it and how to expose it. So imagine that we are on this application that allows the, the user to roll the dice. We're going to have our screen UI state with some dice values and then the number of rolls. The business logic to roll the dice is going to be present in the view model. Here, it's going to be local to this. And we're going to use one-shot APIs, the random API in this case. The UI state, we are going to model it using a mutable state flow, which we're going to keep it private for now. And this is going to be of type dice roll UI state. Whenever we get the user event, we are going to update our UI state uh, using, you know, calling synchronously the, the random APIs. And if the UI wants to listen to these state changes, they will need to collect from our public UI state of type state flow, which is a read-only version of our internal state. This is for local sources of state change. But what if we have something external? Imagine now that we want to greet the user and display their name on the screen. So we are going to get that information from the data layer, from the user repository that exposes a user stream of type flow. This flow, we are going to map it so that we can get the name out of the user object. So this is going to return a flow, right? And we need to expose an, obs an observable data holder. For that, we are going to use the stating operator to convert our flow to state flow. We are going to pass in the view model scope. That's going to define for how long, how long this uh, state flow is going to live in memory, as long as the scope is, is alive. And then we're going to pass in the started policy of while well subscribed. That is going to cancel the upstream flow collections, those coming from the data layer in this case, when there are no collectors for more than five seconds. And the UI would need to collect from this user UI state. But what if now we have to combine local and external sources of state change because of product requirements? So imagine now that we only allow the user to roll the dice if they are locked in. So we're going to have uh, this UI state here, loading, log user in, and also the dice roll. The username and number of rolls are going to come from the data layer, and then the dice values are going to be obtained locally, just as before. So the way to, local, to model the local source of state change is going to be as earlier. We're going to have a role state, mutable state flow, an observable data holder, that is going to be updated whenever the roll dice function is called. Now we need to combine this stream, roll state, with the stream coming from the data layer, with the user stream. And for that, we're going to use the combine function. In its body, we're going to say, hey, if the user, uh, username is empty, then we're going to emit the log user in state. And if not, we're going to build our dice roll UI state combining both streams. Username, a number of rules coming from the uh, data layer, and then the dice values that have been obtained locally. Combine is going to return a flow. And to convert it to a state flow, we're going to use, again, the state in operator. And now, like this UI state and these UI states that we've seen, we've seen so far, they need to be collected, or at least should be collected, in a lifecycle aware manner in the UI. In Compose, we are using the collect a state with lifecycle API that is going to transform the collected values in, into Compose state. And then we can pass into the stateless composable functions that are actually going to render the information on the screen. If you want to know more about this topic, uh, check out the collecting flows in a lifecycle aware manner talk that should be available in YouTube later today. Now we're going to see that depending on the inputs that we get uh, to build our UI state, how to model it internally, and how we are going to expose it. So if we have a local source of state change or one-shot APIs, we are going to model it internally in the view model as a private mutable state flow or compose state. And then we are going to expose it as state flow or compose state. If we have an external stream model as a flow, then we are going to expose it as a state flow using the stating operator. If we have both, if we have at least an external stream, then we will need to combine them and expose it as a state flow, likely using the stating operator again. I didn't have time to cover Compose state in this presentation, but if you are interested in the patterns and how to uh, model your internal UI state here, check out our documentation where you can find more information about it. That's pretty much it, what we had uh, to share today. As a quick recap, we've seen the different types of state and logic that we have in the UI layer, how to manage the complexity of it. So we have the 
This next logic and screen UI state handled in the view model as an implementation detail of a screen level state holder. Then we have our UI logic and UI element state handled in the UI itself or in a plain class. Again, reminder that if you have, you need your UI element state to be used or needed for business logic, then you can hoist it out in the view model. Watch Alejandra's talk later today to know more information about this. We also saw how to produce screen UI state depending on the inputs that we get. And finally, if you're hungry for more information and you want to learn more about these topics and more, check out our documentation. We have stakeholders, UI state production, everything we've seen today, but also UI events, how to handle them in the UI and also from the view model. Thank you so much for going to. I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk. I hope now you also learn, learn a little bit more about the UI layer. Thank you so much for coming and talk to you later. Bye.